Let's go to Psalm 149 today. There are nine verses in there. Let's read all nine verses. Praise ye the Lord. By the way, if you have a margin in your Bible, that phrase, praise ye the Lord, most of the Bible comments say that translates into the word hallelujah. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them that the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. This entire psalm is millennial in its uh, doctrinal or literal application. Nothing about it is hard to understand, although some of the commentators do have trouble with uh, the language of verse 7, to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, because they're always trying to spiritualize it for the sake of Christians today. Uh, Christians today are supposed to be loving, not support violence against others, especially over some religious disagreement. Dr. Woodrow Kroll from Liberty University, in his commentary, says Christians must transpose the letter of the psalm into the spirit of the New Testament. How are we to explain the militant attitude of this psalm? Seen through the eyes of the New Testament and with considerable theological hindsight, this psalm can never be interpreted as a 20th century at the time, call to arms against those who do not share our love of the Lord God. And yet, when the thousand-year kingdom of Jesus Christ begins, dispensing justice and judgment will be our part under the Lord Jesus Christ. That's part of our future as believers. Let me have you turn to a few scriptures to sort of reinforce my point. Go, first of all, to the book of Luke, chapter 19. Luke 19. And verses 26 and 27. Luke 19, verses 26 and 27. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Go forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verses 1, 2, and 3. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more are things that pertain to this life? Go back, if you will, to the book of Joel, the Old Testament, Joel. Chapter 2, Joel, chapter 2, it's a small little book right after Joel, chapter 1, and let's start there with verse 1, we'll read verses 1 through 11, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. 
For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, and as strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pain. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways. They shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall, and shall, excuse me, they shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? And just as a comment, verse 6 says, All faces shall gather blackness. And I wondered what that meant. All faces shall gather blackness. Do you know that the word black and the word bleach come from the same root? And they seem like opposite words. And uh, this phrase is found two other places in the scriptures. Nahum 2, verse 10, and Jeremiah 30, verse 6. We won't turn to them, but when you compare scripture with scripture, you'll see that all faces shall gather blackness means all faces shall gather paleness. So people's color flushes out of their face out of fear. Now, go forward to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Revelation 19. There may be some Bible believers who say, well, that doesn't, that's not what the verse says. Yeah, but I'm comparing Scripture to Scripture to see what the verse, um, how the verse is supposed to be understood. That's the way to do it. Ever take one verse without comparing the commentary of other verses to let the Bible interpret the Bible? Revelation 19 and verses 13 and 14. They say, He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Notice, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So while we don't go out looking for a fight right now, we don't go out trying to make enemies and trying to make people mad at us, they'll get mad at the gospel. They will get mad at what the gospel implies for them if they're not saved. The, the implication of the gospel of Christ is that without trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, every man, every woman is on their way to hell. And people don't, and people can, you might not say it exactly that way, you might try to be polite and nice and soft pedal it from time to time, uh, which is probably a mistake most of the time, but you might try to, you know, be polite and not hurt someone's feelings, but they'll read through it. They'll see what you're what you're saying, and they'll understand what it means that you're telling me that without Jesus Christ, if I'm not saved, I'm going to hell. Is that what you're trying to tell me? 
And of course, that's exactly what it means. So while we don't go out looking for a fight today, we will nevertheless one day do the bidding of the Lord Jesus Christ as glorified saints one day and his servants. That's the application. Now, verse 1 in our psalm today. Praise you the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. That's right on the heels of the last verse in Psalm 148, verse 14. He also exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. This psalm pictures the restoration and the ultimate vindication of Israel, the Jews, the Jewish people. And uh, May 14th is coming up, and that will mark 70 years from the, from the birth of the modern state of Israel. May 14th, 1948, and just uh, in a few short days, another week from tomorrow, will be the 70th anniversary of the modern state of Israel. And talk about one nation going from zero to 60 in record speed. That is one of the, uh, I was, my son and I were talking yesterday, and I, we're watching some uh, video about uh, Muslims and Islam, particularly in Pakistan, and uh, the Red Mosque, and the preachers of terrorism and hate, and the preachers of uh, Islam, and uh, Allah is great, and God is great, and uh, their job is to force everybody to agree with their interpretation of Islam or to kill them. Anyone who does not accept Islam and Allah is an infidel, and uh, the only judgment suitable for them is to be murdered. And they want to, be, they want to do the murdering uh, in the name of Allah and Muhammad, his prophet. And uh, they're, they're, the special was about all these madrasas, these religious schools all throughout the country. And one expert who's trying to fight this trend uh, said there are probably 35,000 of these schools, such schools, throughout the country of Pakistan. There used to be about 6,000, and it's grown to over 35,000 now. And he says dozens and dozens and dozens of kids attending each one. Because Muslim families have a lot of children, and they're told that if your child memorizes the entire Quran in these schools, that uh, he, will go in, he will go directly to heaven, and also... On Judgment Day, he'll be able to bring ten other of his family members with him to heaven for having memorized the Quran himself. And so um, this is what these people are hoping for. And they have big families and not enough money, not making not, not enough money to feed them all. And so you hear about these stories of them marrying their daughters off at 12 and 13 years old because the other guy, the, the groom-to-be, he comes and he says, we need help in our farm. We need help with the goats and the, and the cow, and we need help uh, in labor. We need more laborers. And so they arrange marriages between their children so that the daughter can go and become the servant to her husband, and um, everybody's happy. It's one less child for that father to have to feed, and uh, they think all is well. They have a great, strike a great bargain between themselves. And uh, you see that pictures of those countries so benighted and um, destroyed through war and famine and neglect and poverty. And one of these mullahs, who was the, the leader of this red mosque, he was telling the, the people putting together the, the documentary that the governments have, uh, it's the government's job to provide food and work for all of these people who are not in our schools. Sounds like a Democrat today. It's the government's job. Uh, it's not the government's job. It's your job, pal. Don't have the kids if you're not going to feed them. And if you're not willing to at least work and, and put forth the effort to try and put food on the table. Um, but, but I digress, so forgive me. Anyway, uh, he was saying the government has failed to provide for people. The government has failed to bring about peace and solutions to our nation's problems. And the only uh, solution is uh, Sharia law. Everyone must be under the law of Islam and the Quran. Of course, as interpreted by guys like him. It's always as interpreted by me. 
and you know, um, Islam is divided into multiple sects, and they all hate each other. They go to war with each other. I can show you, I can take you to uh, cemeteries where they have sections set apart for Muslim burials, <clears throat> and within that Muslim burial section, there are smaller sections, one for uh, Hind uh, Muslims from India, one for Muslims of the, of the uh, Sunni sect, one from um, Muslims of another sect, and you can just you can just look at the at the, the types of graves that they have. Even their graves differ from each other. <clears throat> They're not even allowed to get buried next to each other after death, because the other Muslim was not as faithful to Islam as they believed they were. And so this goes on even uh, in their burial grounds. But it'll be the ultimate vindication and restoration of Israel. Israel was restored as a modern state in 1948, or officially in 1948. Uh, and when that time comes, it'll be the Lord Jesus Christ ruling over his people, Israel, uh, their Messiah. Um, look back at Psalm 33 also for a moment. Psalm 33 and I tend to ramble quite a bit, so if we, uh, we rush when we get to the end of this, uh, forgive me. But the state of Israel has become the, the only modern, industrialized, technological country in all of that part of the Middle East. It's the only one. The so-called Palestinians who keep crying persecution, persecution, you couldn't, you couldn't get them to leave Israel, go live in a, a solid Muslim country if you gave each one a hundred thousand bucks. They wouldn't do it. Their standard of living, their quality of life, their medicine, their educational possibilities, everything else they enjoy uh, in the state of Israel is far greater than anything they'd ever enjoy in a solidly Muslim country. You couldn't bribe them to go back to uh, Pakistan or Afghanistan or uh, Iran or Iraq uh, for all the money in the world. But look at Psalm 33. Let's move on. Psalm 33, um, start there at verse 2. Verses 2, 3, and 4. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. God loves to hear the praises of his people, Old Testament and New Testament. And he has commanded the playing of musical instruments. Never mind what any Church of Christ elder tells you. God has authorized, he's commanded the instruments in the Bible, and he says to play loudly. Nothing's worse than a, a funeral dirge in some pipe organ cathedral. Um, that might have been lots of fun in the 1500s, in the 1600s, but how many people are clamoring for more pipe organ music today? I don't know of any. I mean, you know, some church organist somewhere that was trained in a liberal um, academy, and for some reason they're, they're drawn to pipe organ music, but you can find maybe a dozen people like that in this country, and that's about it. But anyway, go, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 5, since we're on the subject. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, because next week, Psalm 150 goes into great detail about this. But Ephesians 5, notice there, verse 19. Ephesians 5.19, Paul writes, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And also Colossians, go forward a few pages, Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell on you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts 
to the Lord. The Church of Christ position is that since it says psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and it says teaching and admonishing and speaking to yourselves, it nowhere mentions the playing of physical instruments. These are all to be understood uh, symbolically or figuratively. But they, but they shoot themselves in the foot using those verses because it says in psalms, it says, speaking to yourselves, teaching and admonishing in Psalms. How many know that the book of Psalms is really the, the song book of the Bible? I mean, all of those notes, the beginning of each psalm, so many of the psalms are musical notations. We don't use that language today, and it's, I'm not certain what they all uh, signify. But uh, musical notations, how that's to be played, maybe it even indicated what, what measure, if, they're, if they... Uh, played music in metrical format in those days or not. I'm not sure. But uh, they were to be played with music. King David was famous for playing the harp to soothe the uh, evil spirits that troubled King Saul. Before he ever slew Goliath, he was famous for strumming a guitar, not strumming a harp, for King David, or for, for King Saul. And so the, 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 the two verses the Church of Christ uses uh, say in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Well, the inclusion of the word psalms uh, undoes their their restriction on musical instruments because the psalms are to be set to music, and they were in the day of King David. Uh, but notice in verse 2 of our text, the king is present on Mount Zion. It says, let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Nothing is obscure for a Bible believer. Uh, Dr. Kroll writes, The deliverance may have been under the leadership of Nehemiah. The new song is of the release from eternal captivity, the captivity and penalty of sin. He says, Our joy in God stems from the fact that He is God, not from what He can do for us. And all of that is spiritualized nonsense. Uh, the deliverance uh, this psalm is describing is the deliverance under Jesus Christ, not under Nehemiah uh, after the Babylonian captivity. Everyone that wants to put it all in the back, put it all in the past, and say it was fulfilled some way in the past, or those who don't believe in any future tribulation or future uh, kingdom on the earth are sort of amillennialist, they try to symbolic, uh, symbolically interpret so much of the Bible over the last 2,000 years of the church age. And Revelation chapter 20, the first four or five verses there talk about 1,000 years. I think the phrase 1,000 years is used six times, if I'm not mistaken. And they say that's a symbolic number to represent a long period of time. It's imprecise. Uh, and so they just sort of relegate that to the church age, however long that turns out to be. And they don't take the Bible literally. But the deliverance, this psalm is undoubtedly... We've, we've, seen this so often in the book of Psalms. For 148 psalms prior to this, uh, the main theme of the psalms seems to be the coming reign of Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the King over the earth and all the nations subject unto Him. And you and I, we, whoops, watch my paper fly off the page. You and I go back and the psalm that we pull out those things that can apply to our, our spiritual walk with Christ right now but the literal application will be, the, will be fulfilled uh, with the nation of Israel when Jesus Christ begins to reign over them. But uh, the deliverance was under Jesus Christ, not Nehemiah. And the song of salvation described here uh, for Israel is already illustrated for us in the Old Testament. Go back, if you will, to the book of Exodus, chapter 15. Exodus 15 Exodus 15, and now the first six verses there should be enough. Exodus 15, beginning with verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, 
and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in an habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And I've mentioned to you before how Psalm 21, verse 3 describes the right hand finding out all those enemies of Christ one day. Um, and then go forward, or go to Psalm 106. Psalm 106. And uh, verses 10, 11, and 12. Psalm 106, verses 10 through 12. It says, And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. Notice, they sang his praise. That's a, the psalmist recounting God's deliverance out of Egypt, drowning Pharaoh, and uh, giving them uh, victory and safe passage uh, out of Egypt. It has nothing to do with New Testament salvation in the church age, as Mr. Cole tried to spiritualize it. Just as Pharaoh was delivered, or rather was drowned, and Israel was delivered, the new song will celebrate the defeat of the man of sin and the, and the false prophet when Christ comes back. And uh, this is the subject matter for Israel's singing, God's Providence, God's miraculous works on their behalf. How could a Jew one day not thank God for preserving his lineage, his race of people, for 2,000 years to the point where he gave them a new, a new modern state in the modern world in 1948? How could a Jew not see the hand of God uh, guiding history and keeping the Jewish people alive and keeping their identity intact, sufficiently so that uh, they could determine who was a proper Jew and who was not in order to immigrate into Israel. But uh, that's the subject matter for all of Israel's singing, is God's deliverance, God's protection, God's uh, victories over their enemies. And look at verse 3, back in our text, let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. A lot of the so-called fundamentalist conservative commentators, all they can extract from that is, in the New Testament, it's wrong for Christians to dance. Well, maybe that's a questionable activity, and I suppose it is, but if that's all you can get out of the Bible, then you're doing it wrong. Go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, and the Lord Jesus... Uh, illustrated this for us. Luke 15, and he gives at least three great illustrations. Luke 15, verse 6, it says, And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Look forward to verse 9. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost, the lost coin. And then, down in um, verses 24 and 25. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. If you can't see that in type, Israel was a son that was lost and will finally return home and God will celebrate, celebrate the return of his lost son, Jacob, or Israel by nation, uh, and exalt him over all the other nations and put a ring on his 
hand uh, and uh, shoes on his feet and put the best robe on him. And uh, he's, for, for this, my son was dead uh, and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they'll begin to be married. And that's how Israel, you know, and not all dancing is sort of the bumps and grinds, uh, you know, high school prom type dancing. A lot of dancing is cultural and folk. How many ever saw Fiddler on the Roof? Were they dancing at the wedding reception? Or oh, just the men do their dancing and the women probably did their own version. Um, I, I went to, uh, um, you know, I went to uh, a Cambodian Buddhist temple two weeks ago. It was a uh, Cambodian New Year. And uh, out of curiosity, I like to go and see what they do and sample some of their food. I really like their deep fried bananas. Those are good. But, um, and I show my face around there, the, the, the people that they recognize me from my day job. And they come up and they're buying me free food. That's, you know, I'm not going to turn down free food. Someone's going to buy me some, some snacks. But when I got there, all of the, the women, and some of them had these ceremonial, uh, ceremonies, so, you know, a special uh, dresses on for special occasions. And they're all, all the women, just the women were kind of doing this dance around this big table, altar table of fruit and things that they had set up. And, uh, yeah, they're, it's, they're not Bible believers, I'll grant you that. But unless you pay attention to what they do, you never going to learn anything about why what they do is empty and why what you have is the real deal. So you got to learn from other people by, by observation. And so a lot of cultures, a lot of society, they have special um, occasion dances, whether it's a wedding, but some sort of celebration where the men might do their, their thing and the women doing their thing, and uh, never the twain shall meet. It's only when you get into a public high school that you got to watch out for the stuff. They throw kids together. And uh, Dr. Ruckman used to comment on Hamitic music with Anglo-Saxon energy is a bad combination. I think it's probably on to something there, too. But... Um, <clears throat> So a lot of dancing will take place among the saints uh, in the millennium, particularly the Jews uh, under their Messiah. Back to our text in verse 4. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. His people from Genesis to Malachi uh, is Israel. And the meek are connected with the poor and the oppressed. I mean, run there. I won't have you turn. Matthew chapter 5. I save you time. Matthew 5 and hear Christ's Sermon on the Mount. By the way, you could summarize the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, as Christ's constitution for his kingdom when he returns. But Matthew 5 and verses 1 through 5, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those with nothing, particularly the Jew, will have the world as their possession when Christ's kingdom begins. And the Jews will be at the top of the heap, of all nations. I don't know how many countries there are in the UN, 170, 180 represented throughout the world, and the, and Israel will be at the at the top, the pinnacle, the preeminent uh, people of all the nations in the world. Back in our Psalm, verse 5 says, Let the saints be joyful in glory, let them sing aloud upon their beds. That can't apply to a church age saint. It'll have to be to a tribulation saint some Jew who resisted the mark of the beast and went into the kingdom in his physical body and now is, is a privilege to see his Messiah finally come and rule over his people as his nation had always anticipated. That can't apply to a church-age Christian because by that time, you and I will have glorified bodies that will never wear out. We won't have to sleep 
Philippians 3.21 says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So you and I, as glorified saints at that time, won't worry about getting tired and having to go to bed at night. One little kid likes going to bed. Kids want to stay up as long as they can, forever, if possible. But mom and dad won't, won't have it. Well, one of these days, you're going to have more energy than a, than a three-year-old on caffeine, uh, and you'll never get tired again. You'll never wear out again. <clears throat> you'll never have to go to bed. You'll never have to rest and recharge your batteries like they say. You'll never have to do any of that. You will be in perfect, glorified, sinless, incorruptible, immortal, supernatural form. I, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around that prospect, but it's nevertheless your destiny as a child of God. And then uh, verse 6, it says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand. That verse has been applied many times devotionally by preachers. A Christian has traditionally had two books. He's had the Bible in one hand and a songbook in the other. And some preachers go so far as to suggest a third book called the checkbook that a Christian needs to live by and not be afraid of tithing. And um, that's my, that might be very true. But um, the Bible in one hand and a hymn book in the other. You, you can accomplish a lot with that. You recall when they were rebuilding the temple in the days of Nehemiah, uh, in, the, in the broken walls around the city, they were, um, they had work instruments in one hand and a sword on the other side, ready for either, um, uh, either opportunity either to slay some enemy that would try to come and undo their work and hinder it, uh, or to keep building. And uh, I like that devotional application, though. Two books. But it's in preparation for verse 7. Notice the, the semicolon at the end of verse 6. And then verse 7, to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. Both the glorified saints uh, from the church and the Jew under his Messiah, will be given the honor of judging nations. The right and the, the duty of executing the wrath of Jesus Christ upon uh, anyone who will not surrender to his preeminence, to his majesty and uh, kingship under his reign. You think that you know, human nature that's been unregenerated, it still remains the same. But to live in a world filled with perfect conditions, perfect uh, climate, perfect peace, there's no crime to be worried about, there's no vice that'll, that'll take over whole communities. Everything seems to be exactly as man has always wanted it to be, and yet, as Jeremiah 17 nine that the heart is deceitful above all things. Sin and rebellion against that kind of rule will still rear its ugly head and rebel against Jesus Christ. And the Jew, under his Messiah, uh, who will enforce the rules of all nations to come and worship the king seated upon his throne, and the saints. You know, many times over my life as a Christian, you have this sort of, and if you're, if you're a true Christian, you love the Lord, and you, and you have a, lot, a desire for righteousness under Christ, you can't help but have these thoughts at times. Lord, make me an instrument of thy wrath. I mean, how many abortion clinics need to be shut down right now? How many murderers need to be put to death instead of sitting there milking a taxpayer at 50 grand a year? How much... Righteousness needs to be enforced in the world right now. It's difficult to live. It's difficult for me as an American to live in what was once the, as Michael Medved says, the greatest nation in God's green earth. But it's, it's slowly and gradually and quickly descending into nothing but chaos 
and sin. Let's legalize marijuana. We don't have enough trouble with drunk drivers. Let's give them one more thing that will repair their judgments. They can kill people on the highways. Let's legalize queer marriage. Marriage between, you know, two women or two men. You just watch. The next phase in that development and is going to be adults with children or it's going to be adults with animals. It's going to be um, incest between two relatives who say, well, we love each other, and you grant free you know, marriage rights to two people who love each other, two men or two women. How can you then say it's wrong for us to marry each other and we're blood relatives? And, you know, in, in Spain, in the country of Spain, 2005, they granted human rights status to chimpanzees and monkeys that are held in cages or in captivity. Apes and gorillas in the zoo and, uh, and so forth. They've granted human rights status. It's not, it's just a matter of time before somebody wants to fornicate with an animal uh, and they want a marriage license to do it. You've got weirdos in other countries right now. You read these strange stories on the internet about somebody in Japan who got married to his robot. It's going to happen. And if it hasn't happened yet here, it, just wait. It's going to happen. And go back to Leviticus 18 and read all the different combinations of perversion. Uh, you know, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father, the nakedness of thy mother, thy brother-in-law, thy sister-in-law, thy daughter, and so forth. All these different combinations of, of perversion. And uh, America is following that same pattern. First it was Bob Carroll, Ted and Alice, and you know, group fornication, group orgies, and so forth in the, in the 60s and 70s, and then just loosen all the, the uh, uh, laws against divorce, where you can get divorced at the drop of a hat for, for any reason or no reason at all. Just, we just decided we don't love each other anymore. And um, usually it's one person that's decided that they don't love the other person anymore, and the other person's the poor sucker that ends up with the consequences. But it, does, it still takes two to tango, as it say. But you just watch. The next thing is going to be, in that hour, we've legalized queer marriage, homosexual marriage. It's just a matter of time before we follow that same pattern and start, uh, people are going to use the same arguments. Well, why, can, why should marriage be limited to two people? Why not a group of people who live in a house together and they, they are attracted to one another? That's what's going to happen. I, I, I could show you articles spoken by, uh, written by uh, um, some of these gay activists professing that that's what their ultimate goal is, to, to dis destroy the, the definitions of traditional marriage between men and women. <coughs> and to say that this country hasn't forgotten God, Abraham Lincoln said, uh, we've been blessed like no, no other nation in history has been blessed, but we have forgotten God. He said that in 1863. If he thought we had forgotten God as a nation then, how far down have we sunk today? I, listen, did I vote for President Donald Trump? Yes, because Hillary Clinton needs to be in prison. <laughs> but I'm not putting all my hopes in somebody like him, guys. How many wives has he got? Three or four? How many children from multiple wives? All these stories about his sexploitation of, of young women. And so everybody knew he was a lech when he got elected. Everybody knew Bill Clinton was a lecture when he got elected, but the media covered for him. That's the difference. I heard a good redneck joke, or just the other day, it's dated, but it was from the 90s. Someone says, uh, I can accept the fact that the first lady, or the president and the first lady are from Arkansas, but I can't get over the fact that their names are Hill and Billy. <laughs> Hill Billies. That's not bad. That's a pretty good observation. And, um, but don't put all your hope, listen, didn't Donald Trump have that, that blonde bimbo on TBN, Paula White, as one of the people that gave a prayer or something at the uh, inauguration? That floozy's been in bed with more uh, so-called preachers, and you can imagine, they got pictures of her holding hands with Benny Hinn on vacation together in Rome. She fornicated with that big black preacher, T.D. Jakes, most of the rumors uh, have it. 
she's a, a loose floozy, and I wouldn't trust her to lead us in silent prayer. <laughs> and if that's and if those are the kind of spiritual influences our leaders are trusting, we're in a mess. And some great oh yeah, we have great economic news, and that's good. And uh, of course, the media, the liberals, will never give a, a Republican credit for any positive thing that uh, follows. We sort of know that already. But do not, I'm repeating, do not put all your hope and hopes for the future in any politician of any party. One party is better than the other, but do not put all your hopes for the future in the works of politicians, or the, work, the, the uh, actions of politicians. And let me try to move on here. I'm kind of dragging my feet. I apologize for that. But um, then verse 7, vengeance, that'll be literal, that'll be upon the wicked at the second advent of Christ. Uh, second Thessalonians 1 verse 8 says, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The heathen, verse 7, are the heathen. We read in Psalm 2, why, the, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The people set themselves in array and the rulers uh, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder. Um, then it says, God shall have them in derision. God shall laugh at the heathen one day. The heathen are the heathen. And I might go so far as to say the heathen are anybody that trusted some man-made prayer by a church denomination. Jesus Christ said, uh, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. The heathen is any pagan who doesn't know how to pray because he never met God. He's depending on a piece of paper or something he read in a catechism book. And then he goes on, punishments, verse 7. That means punishments. Matthew 25 and down there about verse 41. Then shall the king say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye, that worker, ye workers of iniquity. Uh, you separate the sheep from the goats, the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left hand, and uh, so forth. And then uh, it says to bind their kings with chains, verse 8. And you don't need to turn. I'll turn there for you. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. And uh, verses 12 and 13. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If that's not to be taken literally, then how else are you supposed to take it? They will bind the, the rulers of the people, the leaders of the people, the kings of the earth, the presidents and congressmen and senators of different nations, the lords of parliament, um, the backbenchers as they're sometimes called, the different parties in, in Great Britain and all, and all of those, um, with, with chains and fetters and cast them into prison. And then it says to execute upon them the judgment written, verse 9. That judgment was written both testaments. You recall how in Zephaniah 3, verse 8, God says, My determination, my determination is to gather the nations that, my, that I might assemble the kingdoms and pour out my wrath upon them. And then Revelation chapter 19, and verses 15 and 16, talk about God judging the man of sin, God judging the Antichrist, the false prophet, and um, for all of their sin and their wickedness, and judging the world in righteousness. And that judgment is going to come. You and I, as glorified saints, will be the servants of Jesus Christ to help uh, execute that judgment and justice. Like I said earlier, we get uh, frustrated with the crime and, and the rampant wickedness in the world. We said, God, uh, help me dispense justice to you. Now, that's usually how, how Hollywood portrays somebody reading the Bible. He's some nut up in the attic uh, making explosive devices at home, and he's going out there to slaughter somebody in the name of God or quoting some Bible verse to do it. And that's how Hollywood views uh, people who actually read the Bible and love the Bible. But the joke will be on them. The Bible says God 
uh, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. God shall have them in derision. And, and then to conclude with, he said, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. It will be an honor for you to be one of Christ's judges in his kingdom. And that's how he's got it planned. 